my name is Trevor Collins. I'm the uh, director of Esteem, which is the uh, Scholarship and Innovation Center at the Open University STEM faculty. We have been lucky enough to host the conference this year, and I just wanted to uh, open the conference by welcoming you all and uh, thanking you very much for, for registering and for coming along today and tomorrow. Um, the, the plan for today really, uh, you have the program and I'm going to very, very quickly uh, bring that up just to, to show you a point to a couple of things that we'll be covering through today. Um, and then I'm going to be joined in a moment by, by uh, Nick Braithwaite, uh, the executive dean from the uh, STEM faculty at the Open University, who will do the um, opening address for us. Uh, and then Paul Taylor will give us the opening keynote. So let me just uh, share a screen a moment uh, and I'll um, make sure that I point to a couple of the things that will hopefully be helpful for us as we run through the, the conference over the next couple of days. OK, so I'm hoping that uh, you can now see my my screen. Um, this is the, the conference page, the program 2021, which uh, you've all received in the joining instructions for today. Uh, I just wanted to point to this as this is the place where you'll have the links for things like the main room where we are now. Uh, and for each of the sessions through the, the two days of the conference, please use this to access the different rooms for each session. That'll be great. That's the only page that's specific and private to the delegates for the conference. OK, so everyone's received that in the joining instructions. Everything else is on the main UK STEM conference site, OK, as we would usually hold. So you'll see in there the full program. Uh, we have the keynote that will be coming up at a moment, and there's a, a file there, the PDF version with the very detailed version of each of the slots that are available and the rooms that are listed in the detailed program are the ones that refer to the links that you've seen in the um, in the program 2021 page. OK, so I just wanted to point to a couple of those things to make sure everyone knows where they're going uh, over the couple of days. Uh, the other thing to mention on the site, um, you'll see the top area here. There's a section for posters. Uh, <coughs> I don't know some people have been accessing that already. There's also a link there for us to vote for the, the poster of the, of the year as well, the best poster for the, this particular conference. And the closure for that will be tomorrow morning at 10.45. So if I can, we'll mention this through the conference as we go. Please do take time to, to work through those and look at those posters uh, and to, to add in a few, a few votes for the ones that you would like to see uh, winning a prize. OK, so that's the, the program and the posters and the final thing to mention there is the proceedings. And again, uh, the full, full proceedings for the conference are available through the website. That will continue to be available through the website uh, with the links and things in the table of contents here. So another way that you can access through to the specific abstracts and things that have been submitted. Right. That's the quick overview of the site. One of the things to mention is I just wanted to, to acknowledge and thank the support from the program committee, people that have been working with us uh, throughout the year to organize this conference. It's not just the Open University, but across the, the conference committee, and we're very, very grateful for the support that we've received. Um, all of this thing uh, goes together by an awful lot of people that have been involved, so um, we will thank them as we run through the conference. But Right now, I just wanted to hand over to, to Nick Braithwaite uh, for to give us the opening address. Uh, I want to welcome you to this conference. It is by its nature a uh, collegial and supportive of the conference. I hope you're going to have a great time. Please be as sociable as you can. It's an online conference. Make every opportunity to have those conversations. That's why we're here. We want to celebrate scholarship, think about the reflection and the professional aspects of our teaching and learning. And we can only do that when we get together. So thanks for joining us online. I'll declare the conference open and I'll hand over to my colleague and uh, mentor, I think, uh, Nick Braithwaite, a professor and uh, executive dean at the Open University. Thank you very much, Nick. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Um, I, the, the long pause there, I was wondering what you were going to call me. Call, call <laughs> no, me. I had to think of something, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. It's absolutely fabulous to welcome you here. Uh, well, where is here these days? This is the Open University, and it is our mission to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas. So we're really happy to be uh, flexing some of those words now as we do an online conference. And it's an online conference that I have an exceptionally soft spot for because uh, I was in at the beginning of the discussions that we had when we said, let's get something started in this area. Uh, the HEA had something and then didn't. So we uh, we came in to fill the vacuum and we set off 
with a, a slightly different mission, and I think it's one that's been stuck to, and it's really good. Six years later, here we are. We didn't even know it would happen more than once, and now it's happened six times in succession. Um, the Open University. I just wanted to, to start by uh, reflecting on that, and when I have conversations with people, it depends on their age a bit, but a lot of people know the Open University because of that uh, play and film educating Rita, which was good, not absolutely accurate in all details, uh, and a fantastic social uh, story. Uh, but it's it's one of the things that we know, uh, people know us for. The other thing is things that we do on the uh, BBC with people like Attenborough, uh, and it's really a, an absolute privilege for us, and a pleasure to work with somebody of that calibre and to be able to have some small input to the uh, fantastic communications that he does. Now, the Open University is curious. I'm standing, uh, I hope my background is showing the OU logo, which has got a sort of small O inside a U-shaped shield, uh, a very clever device developed 50 years ago. Uh, and I think it stood this, uh, it, it's done good service. Uh, it's stood the test of time, so it's still there. But our, our brand is important to us, and we've been talking recently uh, about what it is that, that makes us special. And I think it's partly what's special about this conference too, so bear with me. Uh, it's because in our case, we join the O to the U. That is the open university. So we are open and we, we don't have any entry qualifications. But we are a university, so we do have exit standards and they're the same as you'll find elsewhere in the sector. That is a particular challenge. And one of the ways that we've combined that O and that U uh, is to try to build our understanding of learning uh, and uh, the curriculum together with the people who are, who are learning it and the people who are teaching it and delivering it. And so I think we, what we've tried to do, and I think over the years we've got better at it, but there's still a lot more to do and it's shifting ground, is we've tried to empower our academics, our teachers, our educators, to be scholars and to be reflective practitioners. And this conference, the Horizons in STEM conference, I think was built on similar principles that it, it, it is, we are the people who are doing, it is us who needs to know. You can be very scholarly just about education and, and it's got a whole um, research area of its own, very worthy, but taking it down to the level of the practitioner doing the scholarship, I think is particularly good. It, it short circuits a lot of things and it gets us right to where we want to be, which is in front of our students, making a better job of it. The sorts of things that are occupying us just now are onlineness, the amount of online, the virtual presence that we're having to do even now, uh, hybrid and blended. We do do in our traditional model, we do have face-to-face, -face, so blended learning is not, is not new to us and there are aspects of that that we might want to get back to. Uh, awarding gaps and inclusivity, enormously important on our agendas right now. And exams and assessment, that comes back every year and the ground moves and the, the spotlight moves around it. But I think the uh, online exams experience that uh, we've all been thrown into recently has, has thrown up some challenges. And it demonstrates that something about the traditional model is there because it just worked in a way. Not perfect, but it just worked. And all the alternatives that we try throw up new challenges. Uh, and there are new anxieties for the students. There are new anxieties for the examiners too. Employability remains important to us. Now, all of these things are, are on the uh, papers uh, that I see in the programme for the next two days, and, and so they should be. They're important to the Open University, I think they're important to this community, and that's great. I don't see quite, uh, and it's, uh, I haven't done uh, digging into every last detail of the abstracts, but there are some other issues that matter to me as an educator, and they are sustainability and alternative to degrees, and that's the different challenges. The sustainability one is we've got COP26 coming up and actually I'm uh, at the Open University. I am the um, Vice Chancellor's um, sponsor, I think it's called, for uh, things on sustainability. That's why it matters to me. It matters to the STEM faculty. I think it, it matters to society and we are setting out on a road towards um, being carbon neutral. And many institutions are. Um, and the alternative to degrees matters because that's a bit like the exams and, and the lectures that we've been so comfortable with over the years. 
It's just one solution, and, and it's the easy one that we know. But if we're going to be doing lifelong learning for longer lives, for lives that are changing more rapidly, I think we're going to need more flexible uh, educational packages. And so we've been looking at that quite a lot within the Open University through our company, FutureLearn. But I'm not here to advertise for them. Uh, I'm here to say this conference is about to set off. Uh, it's now open. We're in our first session. There's a uh, starting plenary, and I think there's a plenary also as the last presentation session before the awards tomorrow. Bookends, if you like, on the real like, business of a conference, which is talking to each other. And it feels a bit strange now, me talking to you, because I can't see you and I'm getting no feedback uh, as to whether or not you're, uh, you're paying attention or, or, or still finishing off those emails. But once you get into the sessions, when we get smaller groups, then I think we can get more interactive. And I encourage you to push the technology uh, and not to hold back. Um, I, I suspect that all the people here in this kind of conference, this kind of subject, are really comfortable with this kind of technology. We work in teams, many work in the uh, platforms. I find that when we get it right, the platform is transparent. Uh, we, we, go, we see straight through it and we get on to the business of conferring and helping each other to improve, to be those reflective practitioners that I referred to at the beginning. So I would welcome you to the Open University, the place that is open to people, places, methods and ideas. And I pass you back now to Trevor Collins, my colleague. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nick, indeed. So thank you for such an address and it, it sets the tone perfectly for the conference. It's exactly um, the conversation that we want to have. We want to be as sociable as we can. I will mention folks that in this particular session with the opening keynote, with having all of us together in one place, what we've done is we've disabled the cameras for the start of the keynote, but I will bring them in for the end when we're asking questions and discussing things with, with Paul Taylor, who's going to join us in a moment. So, um, I'm not going to, to hold things up any further. I'm going to hand over to Paul in a moment. I'm going to bring up his slides a little moment. So bear with me a little second while I while I attend to that. And um, Paul, if you would like to switch on your camera there and just confirm that you're with us, that'll be really helpful. Just <laughs> my anxiety is you might imagine yeah, you can't see people, you never know. Yeah, I'm <laughs> here to have a good morning. Good see you. Good morning, sir. How are you today? Are you well? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. Nice thank sunny you. morning here in Home Firth, West Yorkshire. Oh, if you've got the sun, you've got it better than us, Milton Keynes. Let me bring up these slides. I'll briefly introduce Paul. Paul's very kindly uh, agreed to give us the keynote today. I, I met Paul a few years ago at the International uh, Society for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Um, we were both working there uh, doing some workshops and things. It was great to hear about some of the work he did done at that stage. I've kept an eye on some of the work he's done since, uh, and it was a great pleasure to ask him to come and join us today and share some of the work he's been doing specifically around success and inclusion across the curriculum. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul. One thing to mention, folks, we are recording this particular keynote uh, and we will make this available uh, afterwards in the on the uh, conference website as well. OK, thank you very much. And over to Paul. I'll leave it to you. Thanks very much, Trevor, and good morning, everybody. Trevor, can I just check that my slides are showing properly as they should? Absolutely, yeah, I can confirm they are displaying okay. just perfectly. OK, that's great. Well, thank you so much for the, the uh, invitation, uh, and it's great, great to be here and uh, see uh, quite a few um, colleagues from recent and longer ago in, uh, joining the audience. Good to, good to see uh, old and new friends. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk um, a bit uh, just for 20 minutes because I want to leave time for for discussion uh, about work we are doing at the University of Leeds um, about student success and um, the idea that we want all our students to succeed in the STEM curriculum. Some of the work I'm going to talk about is wider um, than STEM, um, but I'm going to focus on, on a few examples. I'm going to take um, uh, um, uh, the lesson from the address we just, the, the excellent address we just had, um, and, and make sure I mention specific items of, of practice in the STEM field. Um, so I'll I'll get cracking. Um, I'm just going to start by presenting some data about continuation, completion and awarding gaps in STEM. Um, and I'm going to show you some charts from a very recent Royal Society report. Um, I'll pop the link to that 
in the chat when, when I've finished, um, but really sort of sets the scene. And then I'm going to talk through some inclusive teaching practice, inclusive student opportunity, something about some work we're doing on sense of belonging at Leeds. And I'm going to finish talking about decolonisation of the STEM curriculum. OK, um, hopefully you can see these charts um, from this Royal Society report from Joyce and Tetlow. Um, probably just look at this, um, uh, the, the top left one here. Um, the, the, the green line here is um, white STEM students, UK domicile STEM students, and the purple one is uh, ethnic minority students. Um, and what this is, is um, the people who don't continue, who, who leave at the end of their first year of study of their STEM degree in the UK. And what you can see here, and this is undergraduate at the top and postgraduate below, what you can see here is that, that there's a, significant, a statistically significant gap if you're from uh, a black Asian or minority ethnic group, you're more likely to leave at the end of your first year of STEM study in the UK. The next set of charts here uh, for non-completion. So th these are students who leave at any point um, during their study without a degree. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, it's slightly confusingly the, 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 the green and uh, purple mean different things here. So green is first degree along the bottom and, and purple is postgraduate degrees. So the white students here on the right and um, if we focus in on black students here in particular, we can see that black students are very significantly more likely to leave without a degree, as without a STEM degree um, from a UK university than white students are. You can see um, that for, for Asian students, the situation is somewhat different here. And um, if I move on to my third chart here, this is the degrees that students do get if they've um, got that far. Um, here we're back to the, the green line being white students and the purple being um, black, Asian and minority ethnic groups. And here we can see that 80% of white students get a so-called good degree, a first or a 2-1, whereas it's just under 70% for um, the ethnic minority groups. And if the red arrow points at where um, black students would land on here and there's an awarding gap then of 19 percent between black students and white students so quite stark these data are stark aren't they um they're, they're shocking uh, and people will try and explain some of this away by saying there's intersectionality with uh, social groups low participation in neighborhoods and so on but you you can you can only explain a very small amount of this away but the truth is that we're not um, providing our um, black students ethnic minority students um, with the uh, the environment they need to succeed and of course, this is not just about ethnicity. Um, we will find STEM programmes where disabled students have a, an awarding gap or a continuation gap or mature students or whatever. So we'll find other groups of students um, who are being disadvantaged by the system. OK, so um, what can we do? Um, I, I'm certainly not claiming to provide all the answers. It's it's a huge and complex problem with multiple um, uh, multiple components if we want to get anywhere near solving it. Um, inclusive teaching practice, I'm, I will talk a little bit about. Um, and um, this um, is where we uh, at the University of Leeds, um, it, this came out of a focus on the needs of disabled students. Um, but of course, the idea of inclusive teaching practice is that what we what we do um, to accommodate a, a particular group where we're focusing on will benefit everybody. Um, so this is a, a few years ago. Um, we developed across the university a set of six baseline standards for inclusive teaching practice. Um, the first three here are sort of aimed at the practitioners. Um, so. Um, Standard one just says we'll make sure that everything um, is accessible to all students, acknowledging that there will be still some need for some reasonable adjustments. Standard two, that we will release materials in advance so that students have time. 
standard three focuses on assessment. You can read that for your, yourselves. Standards four to six are more the responsibility of the university and the faculties. Um, we will make sure that colleagues have the information they need about inclusive marking, that their staff will be fully supported in achieving the baseline standards. And then finally, um, we implemented a scheme of academic inclusivity leads in every school. So there was an identified member of staff in each school who was able to give guidance to colleagues on embedding the baseline standards. I'd like to highlight the a couple of mini case studies from a couple of um, colleagues who are the, the academic inclusivity leads uh, in this case in the School of Chemical and Process Engineering, my colleague Xiao Jun. Um, I won't read all this out, um, but um, Xiao Jun had a real focus on web accessibility and all the um, online uh, documents we have in our teaching materials and recruited an intern, Ella, um, to work on this. I can just get a little bit of background noise from someone who's got their microphone on, I think. Um, if, if everyone could just check they, they, they're, they're, they're muted, please. Thank you. Um, and you can read this f for yourself, um, but you can see that, that um, uh, Ella started with a fairly modest task and, and this work really took off and she basically ended up providing um, a report on every single module from semester one from the school to the module leader on what they could do to make their materials more accessible. Martine Lopez Garcia in uh, maths um, has taken on the challenge of mathematical equations and I'm sure there'll be plenty of people in the audience here who, who've been grappling with this too. Um, and so it addressed this particular challenge of um, latex documents and trying to, re to um, use HTML instead and, and showing people how they can do that to generate accessible mathematical scripts. Moving on then to inclusive student opportunity. This is an area where um, I am posing more questions than answers, um, but I did want to include this um, because it's an area um, our wonderful school reps in the Faculty of Engineering and Physical Sciences, which is the faculty I'm in, um, surveyed students this year about their um, feelings about how best to address the awarding gaps and continuation gaps and so on. And this um, general area of access to student opportunity came out very prominently. Um, I've highlighted work placements here, but it applies to years abroad and, and all kinds of other opportunities where I suspect in nearly every case we'll find that um, more privileged students with more privileged backgrounds have got better access to these opportunities. So the, the questions we're looking at are, for example, if you've got work placements, um, do um, we have um, internal processes that make sure all our students have equal access to those placements or years abroad or whatever opportunity it is, field trips, so on. Um, I, I, I'm concerned um, in my, my own school of chemistry that, that we have sort of internal hurdles. You know, you have to get a certain grade to progress on that program and so on. And, and are we really careful enough about the effect that may have on different groups of students accessing the opportunity? Are we confident that all our providers of opportunities are using inclusive practice? Um, many companies we work with for, for placements absolutely will, of course, but do we think about that? Do we think about, um, are we sure that the, 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 uh, our students are going to environments that will suit them for their opportunities? Particularly recently at Leeds, um, we've heard about students who've got particular difficulties with application processes for placements, etc., with interviews and so on, neurodiverse students who've got particular challenges in that area. And the final question I'm asking is, if we've got students who are struggling to get opportunities with external providers, is it possible for our own institutions to, to offer 
opportunities ourselves to those students to allow them to get that valuable experience. I've just um, highlighted at the bottom here uh, a, a recentish publication on this topic. Moving on to a sense of belonging and a, a change of colour of slides because the, these are, are from, um, we've got a, a group of fantastic colleagues um, at Leeds, I can't name them all this morning, um, who've been working on a sense of belonging. This is because we know that one of the reasons students drop out of their or, or don't prosper on, on their programmes is because they don't feel like they belong. So we've really tried to work on, on this topic. Um, if I just move to the next slide. Oh, actually, I'm just going to re read out the, this sort of slogan here, which I, I really like to say, you know, to say to colleagues, never underestimate the difference you can make as a personal tutor, as a course tutor, as a, uh, a demonstrator in a lab, as, as someone on a field trip. You can make a difference to whether people feel like they belong or not. On the next slide, just got the, um, we <laughs> scraped around for quite a while to, to try and decide what we meant by a sense of belonging and decided in the end to go with um, Goodenough's um, uh, definition from the literature here. I'll just let you read that. And what we've done then is try and for different contexts um, in the university, um, try and sort of translate that into practice and come up with suggestions and ideas for colleagues about how they can encourage a sense of belonging um, in, in, in various contexts. Um, this slide here shows one we, we produced for um, teaching in the virtual classrooms. I'm really hoping that we're not going to be doing quite as much of this going forwards, um, but I think it's it's a really nice example of how you can take a sort of general concept of wanting to encourage a sense of belonging and reduce it down to simple tips here. Um, give students a chance to discuss the challenges they're facing um, and then um, just obvious things, but do we always do it about uh, about using names and, and just talking to people as though they're people. Um, show awareness of diversity. Um, I think it's further down. You can talk about yourself. I think this is uh, can be um, really effective. Um, I think uh, students may think we're all some kind of, their lecturers are all sort of superhuman beings. So we just talk a bit about our backgrounds and, and show that we're, we're just ordinary people too. Um, Things about cameras, I'm sure everyone's been discussing this um, and um, uh, and then just a, a few more tips down here at the bottom. OK, this is um, my last slide, but it's not the end of my presentation just yet. Um, so um, something else that people have proposed, and I think it's a, potentially a really important contributor to um, that sense of belonging and making, uh, making sure that students feel like their curriculum is relevant to them, is the, the decolonisation movement. Um, quite controversial um, in the news a lot. Um, I've uh, had some interesting comments on Twitter about some of my views on decolonisation. Um, but again, I think what I want to focus on today is not the sort of high level arguments that, that governments and vice chancellors and people get involved in, but what can we actually do in our own context, in our own programmes and so on uh, to make a difference around decolonisation. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, stop presenting this and we're going, to, we're going to go over to a short video, which uh, Trevor will magically make appear, I think. And whilst he's doing that, um, I want to acknowledge a group of fantastic colleagues um, from around the country who've been working on the uh, we've sort of network we've got of decolonizing the STEM curriculum. Uh, and this was particularly about, um, came out of a group um, of 
chemists, but uh, we're part of a wider network um, looking at decolonization of the STEM curriculum. If anyone's interested in that, please do get in touch. Um, and uh, you'll see uh, the contributors acknowledged at the end, but in particular, I think uh, he may be here this morning, Neil Williams, um, really led on this project but I did check and he was very pleased for me to show uh, this uh, short animation I think it's about two and a half minutes long uh, Trevor are you going to press play for me the decolonizing the curriculum agenda has gained a lot of attention and support in recent years However, it remains poorly defined and understood within the academic science community. Are you interested in decolonizing your science curriculum, but don't know how? We have some recommendations based on Schwartz's thesis on decolonizing the curriculum. Review who teaches the program, so students can be exposed to and identify with different kinds of people. Include biographies and histories of scientists. This could include scientists being taught and those that are teaching it. Review what is taught in the programme. Could more local, indigenous or global South knowledge be included? Consider the geographical origins of the science being taught. Is the science being taught truly global? Reflect on what is excluded in the curriculum. Don't just review what the curriculum currently contains. Make the hidden curriculum more explicit. That is the unwritten knowledge gained from close interaction with staff. Consider the nature of the core science being taught. Could it be taught differently, such as moving away from historical Western perspective? Review how the program is taught. Many students benefit more from active learning methods than didactic lectures. Highlight how Global South knowledge is universal. Make it clear how knowledge from the South has global relevance. Well, thank you for sharing that, Trevor. I uh, hope people found it interesting. Um, yeah, the, the, um, Joel, um, it's, it's going to be published at some point in the HE, uh, uh, Advanced HE website. I'm not sure, sure quite when that's going to happen. Neil may, may know more about that. I'm sorry it was quiet. Um, OK, that's the um, end of um, my presentation. I was aiming at Tentus, so that's pretty good. Um, obviously, I've just scratched the surface of this issue. Um, I haven't mentioned the fact the Royal Society report also says that um, non-white students six months out from graduation are less likely to be employed, which is a unsurprising but equally shocking statistic. And of course, um, while we've still got uh, racism, uh, ableism, ageism, homophobia, transphobia, sexism uh, in our society, this, we're going to still have some of these differences. But what I wanted to do was focus this morning on things where there are curricular interventions we can make and where people here may may um, relate and indeed have fantastic examples from their own practice. I'm not pretending I'm an expert on this, um, which, which can be shared either now or through the rest of the conference. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, I will just encourage people to use the uh, emoticons there. I think hopefully we've gotten a little applaud uh, button in the uh, in the application. Just want to make sure there's a little recognition there. And thanks for for Paul for <laughs> for for giving us the overview there. I mean, one of the wonderful things and the and the way in which you've communicated it, Paul, is the equitable approach. Is is the way in which. The conversation is happening, the way that you're listening to different people, the way that you're involved in different people in some of this work uh, and the way it's spread across your organization and the other universities you're working with. So 
you know, I th I think the way in which you demonstrate and uh, you know, practically you know, walk the walk as well as uh, talk it is 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 very very strong in this work. So I'm Thank sure you. there's going to be, and I think that's really important yeah. as well. I mean, I, I I do think it's the perhaps the next big step in our university and I can't speak for for, for other institutions is is for more <laughs> middle-aged white men to actually be to be walking the walk to use your words there uh, Trevor um, and and it not to be a minority activity to be looking at all this stuff <laughs> I couldn't agree more so <laughs> now let's see what there's hopefully um, folks we do have about minor so minutes uh, left and if we if we did finish a little early it wouldn't be the end of the world however i'm sure there will be a few questions and stuff uh coming in now so please do either you can use the chat um do add uh questions and things to the chat or also again using the little emoticons there if you do want to raise your hand that'll uh flag it up to us as well that you'd like to ask a question and i'll i'll just uh, make sure that i can set it here so that everyone can use their microphones and can use the video if uh, they wish to do that so i'm just going to enable those cameras again if people wish to use the camera when they're asking a question it's just to give people the option that's all and uh, if people are switching them on they will appear so a question please. from caroline in the chat i've just posted the link to the Royal Society report. Shall I answer Caroline's question, Trevor? Absolutely, go for it. Um, so inclusive marking. Um, yeah, I, I think um, so it's a, quite a complicated topic and I, I don't feel like I'm completely expert on this. Um, but one, I think one of the real challenges um, a lot of us face is about whether we're assessing the quality of English, for example. So we set some assessment task um, on our science topic, on our STEM topic, um, and then we get an answer, we you know, get an answer in and then we, we knock marks off because of poor English. So now, did we actually say at the start of that task that the, we, we would be marking for quality of English or not. And if we didn't, we shouldn't be marking down for it. That's just one example of, of the kind of thing. So it's really thinking about um, uh, the, yeah, the, the assessment criteria you have for a particular task. Have you actually thought about what that means in terms of, of inclusivity? And if you think there are any issues of inclusivity, have they been flagged to the students? So in, in, in that case, um, if you've got students who, who um, have uh, genuine difficulties with, with English language, they would need support with that assessment task. Um, or you could just decide not to mark down for, for poor English. That's a, a one example. Um, I, you can probably tell I'm not an expert on this topic and there may, may be other people here that probably are who 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 could give give more information on that. But I hope that's uh, helpful, Caroline, in just illustrating what I mean. That's great, Paul. Thank you. There is another question there just before it around inclusive design as well. You might spot it in the in the chat there, Paul. Uh, there's a little bit there. Uh, Hui Dong has sort of asked about uh, inclusive design, what, what some of the challenges are, the sort of, you know, you've introduced some of the stuff, but is there any particular things you might point to with that? Um, oh yes, where to start? Uh, th yeah, <laughs> thank you, Hua Dong, for the, for, for the question. Um, I mean, I, th I think maybe I started touching on it in the in the previous answer. I think maybe the thing to do is to start at the end and think about your assessment. Um, and, and, and come back from that. Um, so how are you going to be assessing your students? How are you then going to make sure that that assessment is going to be inclusive that, and that every student has got the opportunity to get to, to that end point? So I think um, starting from assessment is probably going to be the best way to design inclusive um, uh, teaching. Um, how to um, to then, I mean, then other advice would be um, talk to your specialist colleagues in your institution. So the University of Leeds Disability Services are absolutely fantastic and we'll advise you on this if you talk to them. Uh, we also at the University of Leeds have a panel of disabled students 
um, uh, we can consult them. Uh, we've also got a panel of international students who can advise us a bit on different cultural or linguistic aspects of things. Um, I, I've just started thinking now um, and a, a, actually a very e exciting initiative we, we've um, initiated in the last couple of years is to embed colleagues from the language centre in our schools. Um, that, in, that initially came because we, we had, especially on master's programmes, we had we have a lot of international students. We identified um, that, that some students were struggling with English language, but uh, actually what these language centre uh, colleagues do less than teaching English to the students is teaching staff about how to write good assessments, how to present their materials clearly, how to avoid idiom and so on. And it actually ends up being more about um, literacies and um, ways of thinking. Um, so, so I suppose, um, yeah, think about your assessment and draw on colleagues around your institution who, who are expert in this area and I'm sure will be happy to help. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's great. It is that thing of it's interesting how we think around the literacies as well uh, of assessment and how we are widening our kind of thinking about our own language and how we phrase things to address some of this stuff. It really helps. Yeah, it's brilliant. OK, any other uh, kind of questions or comments, folks, please? We do have a minute or two. Uh, we will wind it up otherwise, but I just uh, want to make sure everyone had the chance to. Uh, those who would like to check. Uh, Neil, Neil got his hand think, up. Yeah, you see what that. <laughs> please see. join us there, Neil. Very much enjoyed the talk, Paul. I was interested in your work on developing a sense of belonging, because I think, I think that's very important. And I just wondered, have you done anything specific for what we call commuter students? Because I think it's a, almost a bigger challenge for that group of students, which are often, in, in my case, represented by BA populations. Yeah, well, we we have um, uh, we we do have a commuter student society um, at Leeds, um, and uh, a, a wonderful student called Susan Preston, um, who. Um, I'm sure she won't <laughs> might be talking about her. She lives in Brick House, which is near near me, near Huddersfield, uh, and commutes in, into well, she <laughs> not so much this year, uh, <laughs> commutes into Leeds to, to study. But she really got on top of this, and actually, she did her final year dissertation on this, um, and uh, I hope she'll publish it. I'd be very happy to share that. Um, but an astonishing series of recommendations, which have just come out, so I, I'm afraid I don't have the hand that I can, and I, I, have, I also can't recite them. Um, but I, I think probably if Susan were here, um, it, she, it's almost the same thing again, isn't it, Neil? It's just test your assumptions all the time. Um, uh, and just, I mean, one of the problems we have at the University of Leeds is a lot of our communications, you know, some, someone who's writing some communications just assumes, kind of like our, our, our wonderful government do, that all our students are 18 year old, live in a residence on campus and whatever. And just that that talk of, uh, talk of, going home for Christmas and things like that and uh, so on. It's really, I just heard this from from some, some colleagues yesterday, it's really upsetting to genuinely upsetting to a lot of students um, who, who, you know, who live at, at their home. And, and then also, of course, there's a whole lot of students who do live in residences um, in Leeds and call that their home, their parents or whatever house might just be somewhere they go occasionally. So I think one of the, it's really important to avoid those mis miscued communications um, and then and Neil I'm sure you've got a lot of um, uh, um, good ideas yourself in, in this area but I think it's just it's a great group of students to test what you're doing against I mean that's inclusive practice isn't it maybe this is where we kind of kind of end is what we do is find a group of students like black students or disabled students or community students we need to test what we're doing make sure it is inclusive for them and if we get that right it'll probably be better for everyone that's the logic of inclusive practice is that okay thank you yeah thank you and maybe a perfect place to end it as well <laughs> let's uh, can i ask everyone for those of you that are able to to unmute yourselves and we'll give a physical applause to paul and welcome everyone to the conference and let's have a little break before the the next set of sessions so microphones open folks and uh, thank you very much Thank you very much. Have a, have a, so, thanks so much for the invitation. Have a great conference, everybody. Um, and and do get Paul. do get in touch.